Open your Bible this morning to the uh, book of First uh, Timothy chapter 2, and I'll begin reading verse number 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I want to talk to you this morning just a little bit about the issue of the will of God. You know, uh, you, you go down to the average uh, Christian bookstore and you'll find all kinds of books, rows and rows and rows of books written about how to find the will of God for your life, how to know the will of God and so forth. And uh, you can go and, and uh, folks uh, uh, pay big bucks to attend seminars, you know, and buy these uh, uh, manuals and so forth about how to find the will of God for your life. And you know, folks, you don't have to go to uh, the bookstore and uh, buy some book. You don't have to go to some seminar. Uh, God has told us in His Word what His will is for us as believers. And you know, it's not so much, uh, sometimes uh, folks get in, in, involved in the will of God, they get involved of, well, does, does God want me to be here in Michigan? Or does God want me to be down in Tennessee? Or does God want me to be way over on California? Or does He want me to be over summers across the sea, across the ocean, somewhere else? And you know, I found it's not the issue of where you're at in the will of God. It doesn't really matter where you're at. Uh, I, I, wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be happy living up here where the ground's flat. Now, I'll just tell you. Uh, the ground's too flat up here for me, and I wouldn't be happy up here. Uh, I'm happy at home. I've got a brother that uh, he lives down just a few miles from y'all in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And uh, he's been up here for a lot of years. You know, he likes it, but, but I don't like it. And I wouldn't be happy up here, and I wouldn't be happy any worse at home. Uh, work down home, a lot of folks come from the south, you know, years ago especially, but uh, still down home, work uh, is hard to find. And uh, a lot of folks, that's the reason he's up here. He got out of high school, went into the army and couldn't find a job, and so come up here because of that. But uh, it was always, my heart was home. And, uh, and I just wouldn't be happy anywhere else than uh, living there where I was born and raised. And so it doesn't really matter where you're at. Uh, it's, it's the thing of God's told you what His will is and doesn't matter where you're at or what's going on or whether it's not a thing of God, do you want me to be over here at such and such time? It's not that at all as you uh, so oftentimes get in, in preaching and teaching that you hear out there in the religious system about the will of God. And folks get all bogged down with some things like that, that that really are not the issue. The issue is God's told you here in His Word what His will is. And all that we need to do, folks, is go into God's Word and see what His will is and then put it into effect in our life. Let's talk about the will of God. You don't have to pray to find the will of God. You open His Word. And right here is the first issue in every one of us's life this morning as a believer, as a person who is saved by the grace of God that has trusted Jesus Christ and His shed blood for the remission of our sins. Right here is the, the, the first issue as we talk about the will of God. He says, "...who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth." Let me ask you a question this morning. Can a, can a lost man do the will of God? Well, if God's will is that all men be saved, then that's the only thing that a lost man can do to do the will of God. In that sense, yes, a lost man can do the will of God because it's God's will that all men be saved. Now, we realize when we talk about a lost man cannot do God's will, but he can do that because that is God's will as we think about this dispensation of grace in which God has sent out the, the riches of His grace and He has uh, not imputed the world's sin unto, unto them, but has imputed it unto the Lord Jesus Christ and He has made us that are saved by His grace, He has made us His ambassadors and sent us forward with the, the word and, and the ministry of reconciliation to beg and to beseech men to be ye reconciled to God. For he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
So a lost man can do the will of God by being saved. And that is God's will this morning, that men be saved. Uh, Peter says over there, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. And when you think about the issue of the unsaved, our relationship to them, it's God's will that they be saved, and He's given His Son to die at Calvary for all men. He has completely paid the price for their sin, and they can come and be saved by trusting in His shed blood, His death, burial, and resurrection is the complete and total payment for their sin. But here's the thing. Come to Romans chapter 10. God has made this wonderful provision for everybody, fixed it so that every person can be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse number 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we all rejoice in that, don't we? We rejoice because that, that meant that we could be saved. And we have been. And we rejoice in that, that, that God's salvation is to all men, full and free. And whosoever shall call upon Him shall be saved. That's the, the riches of God's grace. I love the passage over there in Ephesians 2 where he says, after he describes how that we was before we were saved, and then he says, but God, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, for by grace are you saved, hath quickened us together and, and raised us up together and made us to set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We rejoice in that verse, don't we? Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's will. That's the first issue of His will in this dispensation. But now let's read the next verse. How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? You see, God's will is that men be saved. And He has provided that salvation provided the means for them to be saved, to be forgiven, a perfect standing, accepted in His beloved Son. And yet the issue, friend, is how shall they believe? How are they going to believe if they've not heard? And the answer is they can't. How shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? They cannot call on Him. How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? They cannot. How shall they hear without a preacher? They cannot. And when we think about the issue of the will of God for our life as believers, the issue is that men be saved, but involved in that is the issue of it's God's will that each one of us, that we be involved in the ministry of reconciliation, that we be involved in seeing men saved. And when we're involved in that ministry, folks, the will of God is being done in your life. You want God's will to be done in your life? Then there's what you must do for it to be done. There's what has to be happening and, and there's what has to be going on. The work of the ministry is, is being done in our life. And when that's happening, that's, that's God's will being done in you, folks. We read the passage uh, last night from Philippians chapter 2, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do His good pleasure. That's God's will and good pleasure for your life. That you be involved in that issue of taking the gospel of the grace of God, communicating it to men who are saved. For unless you do that, they cannot call on Him they cannot hear, they cannot believe, they cannot be saved except somebody comes and tells them the message. And there are people that each one of us comes in contact with that nobody else in this building comes in contact with. You know, I think oftentimes... I, I told my wife a lot. I said, you know, I said, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I got saved the way I did. I'm glad that, I'm glad that, that there was somebody 
in my life that, that, that took the initiative to be the, the, the people that made the difference in my life. And for some of you folks who were here yesterday during the question and answer, I was asked to tell how I got saved. And it was my uh, grandma and my grandpa that, uh, that made the difference in my life that come and, and got me when I was a small child and, and that through the years they took me to church. And I told, her, I told my wife, I said, I'm glad I got saved like that. I'm glad there was somebody that made the difference there. Because, you know, there are so many people, so many Christians, that they never speak of the Lord to those they come in contact with. They never speak to the Lord of those that they work with, those that they meet those that maybe the, the girl that, that checks out the groceries or maybe the guy that pumps the gas in your car. Did you ever think about that person's life? And did you ever think about who, who is it that comes in contact with this person maybe day after day after day, year after year, and yet never says anything to that person about the issue of their soul? And you know, folks, there's, there's the thing of the will of God. And I said to you yesterday, most of you know Brother, Brother Doug Dodd and Brother Oscar Woodall, they, they absolutely, I stand in awe and amazement of those men, their ability to speak to people. And, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like that. I, I don't have, I'm, I'm not very good at, at being able to go as, as they can. You know, they, they seem like, you know, people just getting saved around them guys all the time. You know, when they go out on visitation, why, you know, you can just about assume and you can just about plan on the fact somebody's going to get saved. They just have a, a unique ability to deal with people. And, uh, but, but I'm not that way. And maybe some of you are not that way. But you know, folks, just, just the passing out of, of tracks. You know, you go up to the guy and, and, uh, and my wife and, and me, we, we do this. We, we go up, you know, the guy that's pumping the gas, we, we give him a track. Or we, we like to go uh, we like to go to the drive-in sometimes and and we pull up you know and 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 the little gal brings out the stuff we we give her a track and you know there's there's something maybe you're not a very good communicator maybe you're not like maybe you're like Moses and you you feel like you're you're not very good at speaking but just the giving of a track and let the track do the talking for you. But in some way, in some means, what I'm trying to say to you is be involved in sending the gospel out. Your life, your life as an individual, be involved in some means, in some way, in getting the gospel out. That's God's will for you. It's God's will the lost be saved, but they can't be saved if somebody doesn't deliver the message to them by some means, by some how. And if you this morning, if that issue is not true in your life, then the will of God is not being done in your life. You want it to be done? Then be involved in that ministry. Be involved and be moved this morning, friend. Be moved. Be moved by the love. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number uh, 5. Verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. That he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The love of Christ constrains us. You know, the religious system does a lot of visitation, a lot of things like that. But you know, I don't want you to go out there and, and do those kinds of because of, 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 of some kind of, a, of pressure to do it and, and you're not moved. What I want you to do is, I want you to do it and God wants you to do it, but I want you to do it this morning for the right reason. I want you to do it because the love of Christ constrains you. The love of Christ constrains you in your life so that you become involved in that issue of God's will being done in the dispensation of grace, the issue of men being saved. And you're moved by the love of Christ for you. His love constrains you to go out then and be a part. In verse 18, 
All things are of God, hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Look on down in the sixth chapter with me. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. You see, he says, we beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. And in our life as a believer, for God's grace so abundantly bestowed upon us has saved us, that grace we, we read the verse the other day that the, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men and it teaches us. And one of the things that God's grace and God's love does is it teaches you, dear friend, it teaches you to go out and by some means be involved in beseeching men in Christ's stead to be ye reconciled to God. Everybody doesn't have the same ministry in doing that. But everybody does have that ministry. And whatever means that you are able by your abilities to accomplish that. Paul said to Timothy, make full proof of your ministry. We don't all have the same ministry. We don't have the same talents or abilities. But whatever your talents, whatever your abilities were, were in the, the thing lies that you're able to do that. Make full proof of it. Do it. Paul said to the Corinthians, we're talking about the, 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 the taking up the offer, and he said, perform the doing of it. So that's the issue of the will of God in our life. The men be saved. Involved in that is the issue for us as believers to take the message to them so they can be, because they can't be saved if they don't hear. How shall they preach except they be sent? Now, the next issue in the will of God, as we think about God's will for our life as believers, that uh, rest of that verse there, he talks about God's will is that all men be saved, and they come unto the knowledge of the truth. And, you know, you look at the, the immediate context of that, and you, you, of course, think about, you know, well, he tells you the truth. There's one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Well, that's the truth God wants the unsaved to know. But there's another issue that we think about, uh, and that is that God wants men to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that is sort of to the issue of the saved. Not only are we as believers... To be involved in, in, the, in having the will of God done in our life, to be involved in that issue of taking that truth there to the unsaved, but we have a ministry to those that are saved as well. And that's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. God wants men to know the truth. The loss to know the truth of the gospel of the grace of God is to the issue of their salvation and the saved to know the issue of the mystery. Look what he said. Ephesians 3, verse number 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Christ. You see, there's a truth for the saved. The saved that, like some of you, like I was, I was saved out there in the religious system. I heard enough of the, of the gospel that 
that I was convicted and I knew I was lost and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. But beyond that, I didn't know the truth. And it's God's will that men know the truth for this dispensation of grace. And as a believer, if we want the will of God to be done in our life, then that's the next thing that we're to be involved in in our life as an individual. We're taking the gospel to the unsaved. We're taking the truth of the mystery to the saved. We're involved in making men see the dispensation of grace and the truth for it. A message that God has committed to us and in our series here over the weekend, we've been talking about that, that issue of the doctrine delivered to us. I'm going to talk about it a little in the, in the message this morning, but you know, he says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Remember I told you the way that you keep it, the way that you hold fast to it is by preaching it, by having it to live and be real in our life, and to pass it on to other men. And that's Second Timothy chapter 2. Look at it just a minute. Second Timothy chapter 2. And verse uh, number 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. There's the thing that in our life as a believer, we have a truth, dear friend, the truth of rightly dividing the word of truth, the truth of God for this dispensation, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and for God's will, dear friend, you want to do God's will for your life, then be involved in making men see that truth. Come over to Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse number 7. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. You know what the word subvert means? It means to, to destroy. It means to, to take something that and just, just, you just knock the thing off the foundation. You, you absolutely bring it to ruin and to destruction. And you see, there's... Remember we talked about the doctrines of devils. And I said something to you the other night about how do they carry on the, the thing that they're doing. Well, they carry it on and their weapon is their doctrines. It's their lies. It's their fables and their endless genealogies and their vain jangling. That's how the, the principalities and power, that's how Satan is up there and he's out there working in the world with his doctrines of devils. And you know what is the result of that? It is that people in their lives, it is that people, whole oh, how he said they're subverted. Absolutely ruin, absolute destruction and misery and sorrow is, is brought to men. We think about the issue of, of salvation. We think about the issue of, of that, the, the issue of, of, of men in their life. You know, I've down home, I, I've been involved. I don't get to go now like that I used to, but uh, used to I went, I went every Sunday down to the jail and preached. And, uh, you know, you go in there and you, you, you look through the bars at people whose lives have been subverted. Some of them saved, some of them not saved, but yet subverted the same. Some of them need the gospel, some of them need to hear some truths about grace, and they need to hear the truth about how God 
God has a better life than that for them and how that God would work in them both to will and to do His good pleasure. I told them, I said, now, fellas, now listen, you can be a fool for sin or you can be a fool for Christ. And, you know, I said to them, here's what being a fool for sin got you. But you can be a fool for Christ. But, you know, it's been a great joy to me to go in and be able to have a ministry to those people. But, you know what you do? You go in and we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we go in and by sound doctrine, we go in and we, we, we attack and we do spiritual battle against the principalities and powers against Satan. We do spiritual battle against them with the sword of the Spirit, with the sound doctrine of the Word of God. And so not only do people need to hear the issue of the gospel as to salvation from the penalty and the guilt of sin, but also they need to hear the other truths of the mystery so that they may be saved from the speaking of lies and hypocrisy, from the doctrines of devils. There are saved people out there that need to be saved, and you understand that sense in which the word salvation is used in your Bible. That is, saved in the issue of their life. And so, when we think about God's will for our life as believers, it is that men come to the knowledge of the truth, the lost hear the gospel and are saved. The saved hear the fuller truths then of the mystery. They grow and they hear those truths. Now you want to do God's will. You, if it is your desire here this morning and you, you, you're wanting God's will to be done in your life, there it is. Perform the doing of it. One final thing. And that is that we as believers, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, you know, we read the passage uh, last night from Romans 12 where Paul said, Be not conformed to the world. And that's what we was when we was unsaved. But he said, Be transformed. Well, in other words, instead of being conformed to the world, you're transformed, but you are conformed to something. God wants to conform you to the image of His Son. And we understand that in the issue of, of our soul, the issue of the, of the inner man, there's the positional truth there that, that, that we have that. And yet we understand there's the practical aspect and the practical side of that. The issue of the, we've been talking about the, the mystery of godliness, and that is that, that, that God is manifesting Himself in this dispensation through us, those that are saved, the church, the body of Christ. And it is God's will that you allow Him to work in you both to will and to do His good pleasure to conform you to the image of His Son. For God's glory. You know what the glory of God is in the Word of God? It's, it's, it's everything that makes God who He is. Oh, there, there's that passage in Exodus uh, 33 where God says, Moses, he said, or Moses said, God, I want to see Your glory. And God showed Him His glory and God... God passed before him, you know, and he, he began to tell him about his, his mercy and his loving kindness and his grace and, and his righteousness and all those things. You know, that's, that's his glory. And you know what, folks? When we talk about God's glory, God's glory one day in the future is going to be manifest in the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians 3.21, unto him be glory in the church. You ever think about that? We're going to... God's glory out there in the future. And, and, and yet, dear friend, do you ever stop and think about the passage in Corinthians where Paul wrote to them and he said, Therefore glorify God in your spirit, in your body. God wants you and me as, his, as members of His body, God wants to take us and God the, in, the, in the place that He's put us in His body and God wants to take us and He wants to work in us to conform us to the image of His Son 
so that God's glory is manifest in us now. That God's attitude of love, that God's attitude of grace, His mercy, all of those things is manifest in our life now. We don't have that, that, that physical demonstration, that bright Shekinah glory light. We don't have that now. We don't have that. One day we will, but God wants to conform each of us to the image of His Son. That's God's will for us as a believer. And if you, you take all the verses, there, there are several verses about the will of God. When you go home today, you want something to do, you, you want another Bible study, get your concordance out and, and look up the word will in your Bible and, and just start looking down at the verses where He talks about and, and God tells you what His will. But if you look at all those verses, I, I give you this morning what, what I think is just a, just a basic putting it in a nutshell of what God's glory for you is. And I want to leave you with a couple of verses in Colossians real quick before time gets away from us. Colossians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 4. Colossians 1, verse number 9. Let me back up to verse 3. Paul said, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Come on down to verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Why, why would we want to know the will of God? That we might walk worthy unto all pleasing. You want to please God? You've got to know His will. And right here in these verses that we've looked at this morning, put it in a nutshell, that's God's will for your life. And Paul says, I... I pray for you and desire that you be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, <coughs> giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Come back to Colossians 4.12. I'm going to ask you to do something for me. And that is, I want you to do for me what Colossians 4.12 says. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. That, what do you pray most people, when we think about praying for somebody, we think about, you know, praying for um, arthritis and praying for, you know, material things and so forth like that. We've been so oriented by the religious system to pray about those kinds of things. And note the fact that he labored fervently in his prayers. But what did he pray for? That you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and, and on he goes. You want to pray a prayer for me. You want to pray a prayer for some other member of the body of Christ and you down here and us down there, we, we want to pray something for each other. There's something to pray for each other. Laboring fervently, praying that we'd stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And... That is my prayer for you this morning. And I ask you, as Paul did, that you would pray that for me and for us down home there in Tennessee and in our ministry there. And we appreciate you folks here. We appreciate your attention this morning. And I trust that uh, the time together would be edifying and both uh, challenging and encouraging and edifying to you. You want the will of God to be done in your life? Well, there it is. That's what God would have you as a believer to do, to be involved in, to be happening in your life.
I trust that you will perform the doing of it. Uh, a real treat for us to come here and to be with you folks and to get to, uh, to meet you and to have a time of uh, fellowship with you. And, and uh, I trust that uh, most of all that our time together has been profitable. Uh, I thank so much of the passage there that we've looked at where Paul said to Timothy to take heed to yourself and to the doctrine and give thyself uh, wholly to them that your profiting can appear to all. And uh, that's what uh, uh, I hope to be able to do in coming here is for us together to be able to profit as uh, believers in the Lord and to be edified and to be built up and established and strengthened in the faith. Go ahead and open your Bible this morning to uh, 2 Timothy. I called my wife the other night, last night in fact, and uh, she uh, first thing she said to me, she said, you ain't even been up there hardly a day and you already sound like one of them. So, <laughs> well, she really knows how to hurt a feller, I'll tell you. <laughs> to think that I might start sounding like you all up here, I'll tell you what now, that just... <laughs> I don't know if I could take that or not. I'd be glad to get back down home and get straightened back out. But it has been a joy to be here with you folks and to visit with you and and have your fellowship and uh, to get to meet you and uh, to get to know some of you. uh, It has been our great joy to do so. And uh, we have enjoyed ourselves and the time here with you so much. As we look here in uh, 2 Timothy, sort of to... uh, Look at the background of the book just a minute. You know, this is one of the uh, last, uh, uh, the last uh, books here of, of the apostle towards the uh, the end of his life, as we know from chapter uh, four, uh, verse number six. He says, "I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand." So it's uh, coming down to the close, and uh, Paul uh, knows that uh, his time here is short. The time of his departure is uh, close by. And uh, he gives uh, some final instructions here uh, as I look at the, uh, the, the book of Second Timothy as a book of, of sort of final instructions. Uh, that is, he is ready to pass off in his life. And here he has committed this message to Timothy and he has some final instructions, uh, uh, charges and encouragements and things of this nature to say to him, uh, to encourage him uh, in, in the battle. And so I'd like for us to, uh, to look at some of these things this morning in Second uh, Timothy and uh, uh, that we might gain some encouragement and some spiritual strength and nourishment, uh, that we might be able to go out and to be faithful with what has been committed to us, that we might uh, keep the doctrine, hold fast the uh, traditions that we have been taught, and that we might uh, be faithful to preach and to teach God's Word. Second uh, Timothy chapter 1 this morning, verse number 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now as Paul writes here to Timothy... You know, Timothy is a guy that he's had the truth now, and he's uh, been out there in the ministry, and he's uh, been been preaching. And, you know, the thing so often with us as believers, you know, you get saved, and there's that great joy and that great excitement that's uh, in your heart when you first get saved. And, you know, uh, I, I know my, in my own life, when, when the, the, I first learned the, the issues and the truth of rightly dividing the Word and, and come to understand the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, there was, there was great joy in my heart, folks, to come out of the, the spiritual darkness that I'd been in in my Christian life. And it was, it was a joy that, that I wanted to share with other folks and I wanted to tell other people and uh, have them to come to see and to know the, the joy that I, that I felt down in my soul. 
And you know, sometimes though, we as believers, after a while, and, and you know, the, the, when the rubber kind of hits the road, so to speak, and you go out and you find that everybody's not going to be very happy and they're not going to be too glad to receive what you've got to say, there are some afflictions. And Paul talks about that there. There are some afflictions withstanding for the truth, especially in any time, but especially as we've been talking about Paul's instructions for the last days, especially in, in, in thinking about the issue of, of being in a time of apostasy, being in a time when, when men turn their ears from the truth and turn to the fables and the vain jaggling and, and the doctrine of devils and so forth. When you go out and when you take a stand for the truth, everybody's not going to like you and folks are not going to receive always what you've got to say and, and a lot of times they're going to reject you and not want to have anything to do with you. And sometimes reality hits us in the face then, don't it? And you know, we sort of kind of cool down and cool off just a little bit. And Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Timothy, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, there's uh, some dispensational things there with that verse about the, the gift that was in Timothy, the putting on of Paul's hands. And we understand that we, we don't have that, uh, that ability or that's not going on today. But we do have something that God's given to us. God's given to us a message. God's given to us now His completed, His written revelation of His Word. And that's the, that's the gift that we have this morning, you and me, we have the message of the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And what we need to do this morning, dear friend, as, as I think about us and, and, and I think about sometimes we've, we've had the message and we've known it and reality has sometimes just smacked us in the face and, and we've uh, sort of settled down and cooled off and we've forgotten a little bit. And you said, I want to put you in remembrance. And we need to be put in remembrance sometimes. We need to be put in remembrance of the fact that we was lost, dead in trespasses and sins, and yet God did love us, that He sent His Son to go to Calvary and die there and to pay for all of our sins. We forget that sometimes. We need to be reminded. Down home they uh, sang a song, a uh, uh, lady there, about to roll back the curtain of memory every now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. We need to remember sometimes just what we was, dead, alienated sinners whom God so richly loved. And that's why I read the passage this morning from Romans chapter number 5, one of my favorite passages, to read how that God loved me. How that even though I was ungodly, I was without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And I think about the fact how that even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, while we were yet sinners, He said, Christ died for us. But God committed His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I mentioned in the Sunday school time about going down to the jail there at home and preaching. And you know, as, uh, as I, I preach to the men there, I've, I've looked them right in the eye and I've said to them, you know, fellas, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's not anybody in here that, that I'd give the, the, the life of my wife or my children for. Cause I love them. And I wouldn't give them for any of you. And I've said this to them as well. I don't know anybody on this side of the bars that I'd give them for neither. But you know, God committed His love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gave Himself, God gave His Son for me. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die. I mean, I don't even know anybody that, that I think's good that I'd sacrifice them for. But you see, God sacrificed Himself. God sacrificed His Son for us, a world full of sinners. And you know, when Adam was there in the garden and when Adam had sinned, God didn't have to come and say, Adam, where art thou? He was under no obligation to do so. But when He come to Adam, Adam hid over in the bushes like where we was all hid at. Some of us was hid behind our religion. You know, some of us was just out there and we was hid in... In, in our self-righteousness, and I'm just as good as everybody else, and so forth. We was all hid somewheres. But yet He come and He said, Adam, where art thou? That's grace. Because God didn't have to do that, folks. But He did. 
grace, mercy. Sometimes we need to look back and we need to remember. We need, dear friend, to keep the issue of of the fact that God loved us and that He saved us. There's an issue you want to keep close to your heart. I like what Brother Rick Jordan says. He he says, if your preaching ever gets far from the cross, you're... And that's true. And you know, folks, if we in our lives as individual believers, if we forget, and sometimes we all, I do, I need to be reminded. I need to remember what He did for me. That His love might constrain me. That it might move me to serve Him. The Thessalonians, it said they serve the living and true God to serve Him. Serve Him while we wait for Him until He comes. I put there in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. Come back to the book of Jeremiah. You know that word stir there is... Uh, we, we had our little little southern dictionary, the, the, the title of that book that uh, we, we left for Tom when he come down our way. It's a How to Speak Southern. And uh, it's, a, it's a dictionary, like he said, a dictionary for, for all Yankees, you know, How to Speak Southern. And uh, I told you last night, you know, when I say the word far, I'm not talking about distance. I'm talking about that stuff you put your finger in that burns you. We go back here now to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 20 and chapter number 23. And we're going to read about some far, so you'll know what I'm talking about here. Jeremiah chapter 20. Verse number 7. O Lord, Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and I and, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. You know, Jeremiah went out with the message that God had given him as a message of, he says he cried violence and spoil and talking about God's judgment and, and so forth upon the nation. He went out and he took that message and, and, uh, and, and he says to the Lord, Lord, you deceived me. I was deceived. You know, Jeremiah thought that everybody would want the message, that everybody would be just glad to have it and glad to hear it, and boy, they'd just receive it with open arms and come to see the truth that he had for them. But they wasn't. Instead, what was he? He said, I'm in derision daily, and everyone mocketh me. He said, I cried out. That's what God wanted him to do, because the, Lord, the word of the Lord was made a reproach and a derision daily. And that's the same thing that we face in our dispensation as we go out and we face the religious system that's out there and the form of godliness and, and all the, the fables and all the things that are out there in that religious system. We go out and we face that. Jeremiah faced the same thing. He faced the, the religious system in his day. He faced the doctrines of devils in his day. And we go out sometimes, that, 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 that new energy, that new joy, that when we first learn the truths, that we go out and we think that we're going to go out and we're going to be able to just get everybody to see it and everybody's going to receive it and be wonderful and everything happy. And reality hits us in the face. And we find out we're a reproach and a derision and everybody talks about us and everybody warns you, you know, warns other people. I go out and I've went out and visited there down home and and, you know, you go in and, and everybody's done, done, done already gossip and, and told about how you all are a bunch of Paul worshipers and all that kind of stuff. And, and you talk more about Paul than you about, do about the Lord Jesus Christ and all kinds of things like that. And, boy, it's, it's a real downer, ain't it? And sometimes we get discouraged like Jeremiah did in the next verse. Then I said, I'll not make mention of him nor speak any more in His name. Sometimes we get like that, don't we? We get to the point of, I just won't say anything about that. I won't, I'm not going to bring up Paul to my Christian friends or to these people over here. I'm, I'm not going to say anything else about the dispensation of grace or I'm not going to talk about the mystery or... I'm not going to talk about all of this. I'm just not going to say anything else about it. 
But notice what he said. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. You know, folks, you look at Jeremiah, you look at the Apostle Paul, and folks, one thing that, that carried men, you look at the men down through the Word of God, that, that, that they took God's Word and they carried out and they finished the course and the ministry that God had given them, and it's the issue, folks, of keeping the Word of God as a fire burning in your bones. Keeping that issue of God's Word. He said, it's like a burning fire that's shut up in me. And I had to speak. I didn't want to do it. I wanted to just not say anything else about Him and not, not, not tell His message anymore. But I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. Jeremiah had a fire that burned in his soul, but burned down in there. And you know, folks, sometimes we as believers, there's a tendency that that fire begins to die down. And we're not opening our mouth. We're not in, in the way that God can take us and use us. You know, that's an amazing thing to me. You know, God, when He, when he used the different men to write the Bible, He used their personality. He used the person they was to do the job that He wanted to do with them. And God still does that. He don't make us all the same, but He uses us, the person that we are, the personality that we have. God uses us to do the job that He wants to do with us. But there's that issue of keeping that Word, keeping it stirred up keeping it stirred up and, and the far fed. And how do you do that? thing we talked about to you last night. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine so that thou can save thyself and them that hear you. You keep those issues. You stay there and you keep the fire lit and you keep it built up. And folks, when that fire is burning in your soul like it was with Jeremiah, we keep those things there and we keep feeding that fire. And sometimes we need to look back and remember and stir it up a little bit so we can go out then and get a little encouragement, a little strength, a little spiritual food and build up in our soul and we go out and we keep talking and we keep telling and we keep preaching, and we keep taking the message. Look in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. He said, Is not my word like as a far, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Boy, I like that verse. I like that verse, folks. That's, that's the power of God's Word. That Word will do the work. Our ministry is always triumphant. Sometimes we go out and we, we, we preach and, and we go out and we witness or we, we pass out tracts and it seems like, you know, we're, we're, we're just not getting anything done. But you know, Paul said the ministry is always triumphant. And if folks receive the message and hear the message we have, then it's a savor of life unto life. And if they reject it, it's a savor of death unto death. But hey, folks, we win anyway. God's going to win in the end. And if those that want to hear the message and be saved by the grace of God, they want to come along with us, they can. And them that hears the message and rejects. And we don't wish that. We don't want that. But they do. God's still going to win. And the testimony that we give will be a witness against them. You look at that passage there in Romans 3 and, and, and you read that and you get the thing that, that men at the great white throne judgment, they're going to want to talk back to God. They're going to want to talk back to Him. But you see, God's going to have the thing on His side. But you understand God's Word is afar. It's the hammer that breaketh the rock to pieces. That book, folks, is powerful. And it's the weapon that we need to take and weld that weapon in our hand. Come to Second Samuel chapter 23. Second Samuel chapter 23. 
verse number 10. The story here of Eleazar and the Philistines, they were were having a battle. He was one of the three mighty men with David. And they defied the Philistines, verse 10. As it were gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away, he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clave unto the sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. O Eleazar, as he fought that battle, his hand had held on for so long to the sword and held it so tightly and gripped the thing. And you've done that. You went out, maybe you've done some kind of work and and you ever get to where you, your hand, you, you, you just have to, to prize it open. It, it just gets so weak because you've held it in that position so long and he'd held the sword so long that, that it was just in his hand and it was held on, become a part of his hand. And folks, that's the same thing the Word of God is to us. And what we as believers need to do sometimes is just to be reminded. Remember to stir up the gift. To stir up and fan the fire. And that's what we've come in this conference to do. We've come here to to edify each other. We've come here together to have some profit together. We've come here with with line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, to be edified, to be built up, to remember, to stir up the fire, fan the thing a little bit, so that we can be encouraged then to go out in face of adversity, in face of the afflictions of the gospel of Christ, that when you stand for the truth, when you stand for the truth, folks, the world system out there is run by Satan. It's controlled by him. And when you stand for the truth, there's going to be afflictions. But you see, we come together and we stir the thing so that we can have the courage. We can have the spiritual courage. You see, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sometimes we're afraid. Sometimes we're afraid to say the Lord's name to somebody. Sometimes we're, we're afraid... We get afraid sometimes to talk about Paul and we talk about the mystery and talk about the age of grace and the message committed to us. But that doesn't come from God. That comes from Satan. But it's in the thing of stirring up the gift, stirring up the Word of God that's in us, and fanning the flame so that we go out then and the courage to go forward and to keep speaking. You know, folks, we don't do this thing in the energy of the flesh. You can do it in the energy of the flesh, but we want to be moved and motivated by the right thing and the thing that will move you and the thing that will motivate you and the thing that will sustain you. is like old Jeremiah. His word is a fire shut up in my bones. And he couldn't help but speak. Now, I'll tell you something, friend. That's no different for us today. No different. Come to chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Or 2 Timothy chapter 4, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Another good study. Timothy is just full. 1 Satan Timothy is just full of good things to study. Go through some time and study the charges of Paul that he gives here to Timothy. And this is the last one. The final charge, as he's wrote about the issue of doctrine and godliness to Timothy, he's told him to war a good warfare, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. He comes down to the issue and all the instructions that he's given. And boy, what a joy it would have been if if we could just all meet together like this and and, and, and just take two or three weeks and just sit down and study all the things that are here. What a joy it is. But here's the last charge that he gives to him. And I thought it appropriate for us as we end our time together that we look at Paul's last charge to Timothy. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the Word. 
In that issue, Timothy, he said, Old Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Hold fast what's been committed to you. That good thing, back there in chapter 1 of, of 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse uh, 13, he said, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwellest. This now knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Hold fast. Keep it. You don't know how to do that? Preach it. Preach the Word. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Folks, God is going to judge the quick and the dead. And, I, and as I look at that passage, there's an issue there, folks. There's an issue of the fact that we need to understand this morning God's going to judge the unsaved. God's going to judge them. And the thing, dear friend, the thing that will save them from that judgment is if we go tell them how that Christ died for their sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You know, folks, we as believers... We're told to walk in love as Christ also loved us. We're taught of God to love one another. And if there's something this morning, if there's, there's a thing that we as believers, that we are to, and that we, we want to have in our life, is that we would cultivate the love of God in our heart and life, that we would have a love for sinners. And we'd have a love for people that's lost. The love of Christ that He had for him, that that love would, would move in us and constrain us and motivate us, that we'd have His love for people and we'd tell them the message. In view of that, preach the Word. But there's another issue that I think about as well when I look at that verse, and it is the issue that when the Lord comes for us, there's an accounting time for us as believers of our stewardship. And you know, Paul talked about the issue, and I think Tom had mentioned it to the Thessalonians. Paul was just there a short little time, and yet those people got saved, and they, Paul said to them, that, that, that your faith is spread abroad. Everybody's heard about you, and heard, everybody's heard what went on down there, and they've heard... How that, that, that you, the Word of God, has been sent out by you. And you think about the issue of how so fast and how so short a time could those people be saved and yet so moved. And you get the issue there of the Lord's coming. They had the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope. They'd turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. The issue of the Lord's coming for us as members of the body of Christ. And Paul charges him before God and the Lord Jesus, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, to preach the Word. Folks, a sacred trust, a thing that has been given to us, the gospel for this dispensation has been given to us as believers. And when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, at His judgment seat, to give account of that stewardship. I like what Tom said the other evening we were sitting there, and he said, you know, most folks give more money to the pizza man each week than they do to, to the local assembly for the support of the ministry. What are, we going to, what are we going to say to him about the issue of our financial giving to the work of the ministry? It takes money to... To operate a church, it takes money to have a radio program. We have a radio program there, and, 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 and we, we used to have a newspaper article. We don't have that now because of just the, the shortage of, of funds. We've uh, had some folks that were taking care of that first, but, uh, but not any longer. And, and you know, it takes, takes money to do these things. It takes money to be able to preach the gospel and send it out. But what are we going to do when we stand before Him and face Him with that issue of our stewardship? the issue of our stewardship of the responsibility that God has given to us as every believer. We talked to you this morning about the will of God in the Sunday school time 
And God's will, dear friend, is that men be saved. And how are they going to be saved if they don't hear? How are they going to hear if we don't go tell them? And when we stand before Him with that issue, the charge is preach the Word. That's what you've got to do. That's the charge. That's the challenge to us. That's the issue of our life, folks, is preach the Word. And you know, it's so easy. Look back in chapter 2 just a minute, verse 4. That, that verse right there, verse 3 and 4, that verse speaks to our lives as believers so very, very much. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now you know it says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And if there's a verse that will dig you up real quick, that one will. That will pierce you. For we all, I do, I find it in my life, we all get so entangled and so wrapped up in the affairs of this life that we forget that we are here as soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ to preach His Word, to take His message. That, dear friend, Paul said to Timothy, Timothy he said, you've known my doctrine. You've known my manner of life, the issue of godliness. You've known my purpose. What's your purpose this morning, folks? When you this morning, when we when we think about our life, what's what's the purpose of your life? Most people, you know, out there in the world, they think about the purpose of their life. Well, you know, they think about, well, I'm, I've got my wife or my husband. I, I want to be a good husband, a good wife, a good spouse. I want to be good to my children and... You know, we're working to, uh, we, we want to have a home and all these material things and so forth. And, and yet we realize that there are material things that we must have to survive. But yet, dear friend, we are so prone to get so enwrapped and so entangled that we forget. We, we forget. And we need to be reminded. We need to remember. We get so wrapped up that we don't have time to participate in visitation, or we don't have time to to come over and, and in some way help in the ministry of the church because we're so wrapped up in all the other things of this life. And when we stand before Him, the issue is going to be preach the Word, the stewardship God has given us, that deposit that He's placed within our trust. He has entrusted us you know, folks, God has entrusted His... The will of God's heart is that men be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. And He's not making personal appearances to people today. He's not having dreams and visions of things of that nature, but He has entrusted to us that ministry of going out in His place and dealing with men about the issue of salvation, the issue of the truth of the mystery and all these things, we've been entrusted with something very precious. I charge you, preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having each in years. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Folks, when we think about the issue of that verse right there. I'm not talking about what's been way back there in your past somewhere. There's, I'm not talking about five years ago or two years ago or one year ago or two months ago. I'm talking about right now, this morning. As we sit here together and as we all think about the, the issue of our life, 
as a believer, as one who has been entrusted with the gospel of the grace of God, as we think about, come to this passage in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, verse 3. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. You can go back to chapter 1 of 1. There's something else that as you read through you find out Paul has something to say about conscience. Let's just go back and read the verse. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5 the end of the commandment is Charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling. Come down to verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Paul has a lot to say about our conscience. Very simply, our conscience, that that sense of of right and wrong that we have. And as we this morning, as I think about Paul, you know, you you think how... As he, he looks back at his life and he says, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the... I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. I have done this. Right here this morning, right now, not way back, but now, as we think about our life and we think about the issue of Paul saying, I've served God with good conscience, can we say that we are now, are we fighting a good fight? Are we fighting the good fight? Are we finishing the course? Are we keeping the faith? None of us are perfect. We certainly understand that. We're not perfect. Paul was not perfect. That's not the issue. But the issue of what's been given to us, as we sit here this morning, the issue of that deposit, that which has been entrusted to us, the stewardship of the gospel that we have, the Word of God, and the issue is to preach that Word, Timothy. Keep it. Guard it. Hold fast to it. Commit it to faithful men who can teach others also. Can we say that we are fighting a good fight, finishing the course, keeping the faith? And you know, folks, when the Word of God digs us up, as it does, and boy, that that verse digs me up about a lot of things. And you know what you need to do about it when it digs you up? Do something about it. There's a verse over there in the book of Hebrews... Come over there just a minute. Uh, I thought it was chapter 4. Let's see. Where's the verse today if you hear His voice? Harden not your heart. I can't see it. I thought it was... Yeah, there it is, chapter 3. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. And on he goes. God was grieved with the nation because when they heard His voice and He told them what He wanted them to do, they hardened their heart, they stiffened their neck, they rejected God's Word, and they would not do. And you know, folks, we sometimes forget, we know we're not living under the law, but we're under grace, but we sometimes forget that God does not want any less from us today. God always wanted Israel to bring the best they had in their sacrifice to give to Him. Not to give to Him the sick and the lame and 
offer something that was wrong with it, but He always wanted the best. And God still wants that from us. God wants our best. He wants our best service. And folks, today if you hear His voice, harden not your hearts. When the Word of God digs us up about these things and we think about the issue of our conscience and the Word of God sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces us right through, pricks us in our heart about things in our life. When you hear harden not your heart. But do something about it. And there's things in our life that we know that, that in that area we're not maybe given our best service. Maybe it's as a husband, maybe we're not giving our best service to our wife or our wife to our husband or as a mother and daddy to our children or as members of a local church, a local assembly to each other. You know, Paul talked about the aged men and he talked about the aged women teaching the younger women, all those things. When the Word of God digs us up, do something about it. Harden not your heart. I think of the verse where Jesus stood out over the city of Jerusalem in Matthew 23, and He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them that are sent unto thee, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen doeth her chicks, but ye would not. That's our problem a lot of times. How God would work in our life to conform us to the image of His Son. How God, the heart of God is to take us, dear friend, and, and, and do what He's doing today with us, through us, His body. In the place that God has for us, our place, whether we're maybe not the eye, but we're the hand or we're the foot, whatever part of the body it's, we're placed in it as it's pleased Him. How God would take us and work in us, both to will and do His good pleasure. But how so often we will not. And I trust this morning, as we think about the issue of the charge, the responsibility we have, the stewardship of the gospel, that we, dear friends, will be faithful to fulfill it. Stay close to that book. I remember the words back there of the psalmist. He said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. You know, folks, sin will keep you from this book. But this book will keep you from sin. What a great, powerful thing it is. I don't know if I've been able to communicate to you what I feel in my heart about His word. But that verse in Hebrews 4 12 means so very much to me that the Word of God is quick, powerful. It is. And it is through that Word that He works in us, His people, to carry on the ministry that we have. May we, like Eleazar, may we hold on to it, may we cleave to it, and let it work its work in us. And go out and do battle for Him that loved us and died for us. It has been my great joy to be with you. I appreciate you folks here so so very much and your ministry here. It has been, I cannot express to you the great joy that it has been to come. I I've had knowledge of you, as I said, for many years and just never been able to come and be with you. But I have so very much enjoyed this privilege, this opportunity to get to meet you folks here and to get to know you better and, and to see your ministry here and to see what God's doing here in this area. And I do appreciate it so very much, you allowing me to come. And I have truly enjoyed it. And uh, I just trust that uh, as we leave... The verse uh, there this morning in the Sunday school time, Paul talked about the guy that labored fervently in prayers. You know, we are, we are separated by great distance. And yet, dear friend, as members of the body of Christ, we are linked together in Him.
And we have in common God the Holy Spirit, and we have in common His Word. And may we pray for each other. As Paul, separated by great distance, he'd always say to them, pray for me. And he'd say to them, I pray for you.